Hey there, thanks for watching. This is the first in a series of interviews about modern security programs, scaling security, secure by construction, and trying to eliminate classes of vulnerabilities via secure defaults. I'm your host, Clint Gibbler. Uh, I'm currently the head of security research at R2C, a startup building SEMGREP, an open source, customizable, lightweight static analysis tool built for modern development. And I'm also the creator of TLDRSEC, a free weekly security newsletter bringing you the best security research, talks, tools, blog posts, and more right to your inbox. And you can check that out at tldrsec.com. But I couldn't be more excited today uh, to chat with my good friend, uh, Jacob Selassie, who is the Director of Product Security at Snowflake. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you, Clint. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for thinking of me and including me. Of course. Yeah, we've uh, had many discussions uh, over the past couple of months and I guess years now, uh, and I've learned a lot from you. So I'm excited to uh, get into it today. Um, but I guess before we do, um, yeah, could you tell me a little bit uh, about yourself and your background so that people listening can have some context? I want to keep it brief because sometimes I tend to go on, on and on on this topic. So anyway, uh, I would I would essentially say is I came from kind of a non-traditional background. I, I don't have a degree in, in computer science or, or anything else. I was a sort of a, you know, hacker in my spare time, got into network engineering uh, and slowly had kind of a convergence between my my hobby of security and my my career. Uh, but essentially moved from a network engineering support role to essentially a, a development role on a, on a product, Citrix NetScaler. Uh, and then from there, I pivoted into to AppSec. So I had kind of transitioned from support into development. I really liked that. I had done that for a number of years. And then I had an opportunity here in the Bay Area to work with a good friend of mine uh, at a healthcare startup and to, to try to pivot that developer background and the security background into an, an, an AppSec sort of uh, leadership position. So took a run at that. Uh, I felt like uh, kind of my experience on both sides of the fence kind of gave me a, a perspective that at least it seemed to it seemed to connect with developers and that seemed to be the right move. And then I think if you sort of look at how, at how the industry unfolded over the last five years, it's been all about focusing on developers. So, you know, I didn't think of anything revolutionary there. I think I was just you know, maybe in the right place at the right time and, and just had the right background. So good luck. Um, and then, uh, you know, that, that ultimately progressed to, to, to Snowflake where, uh, you know, it's, it's been more about uh, the focus on all of product security and the larger uh, running a security program at a large company versus kind of a, a smaller focused AppSec team. Uh, and that, that's kind of been my journey. Yeah. Nice, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um... You know, one thing I love uh, about security is I feel like there's many people from uh, sort of not just the sort of cookie cutter traditional backgrounds who are still like incredibly successful and doing really well. And uh, I totally agree with you that I think the having a developer background helps uh, give you like empathy and just understand the world of uh, developers who were often asking to do things a bit differently for security. So being like, yeah, I was once you, uh, totally agree. Um, yeah. I guess one, one like thing I just, uh, I think we could probably chat the whole time just about um, like your career thoughts because you, I think you have a lot of really great stuff there. But just one thing that I was curious about is you seem to do like a series of hops uh, between jobs and roles that are um, not directly related, but are maybe like uh, like adjacent. And I'm curious like how you got either the skills or knowledge or ability to transition between um, like, I don't know, like, network engineering and development or development and AppSec. And was this just like you sort of teaching yourself on your own, taking on additional responsibility at work because you just wanted to and sort of teaching yourself on the job? Or I'm just curious, like how yeah. that worked. I feel like a lot of people want to make these types of transitions, but it's not clear to them how. So it was a, a bit of both. I definitely had to teach myself a lot of things and I definitely had to invest on the job and outside of the job. So those things should be clear, clear to anyone. Um, but it's more about sort of some like pivotal moments that caused me to set goals and then ultimately me trying to make the most of every opportunity I had to, to reach those goals. So once I understood that I liked writing code and that I could do that, I think a lot of people who don't write code perceive uh, like some sort of barrier between what they do. Maybe they think it's it's scripting and somehow they have a perception that it's less than I'm here to tell you that it's not. 
And once I sort of got past that mental barrier and thought like, oh, I can write code too. And I can write code with, I don't want to say the best of them because there's some really great people and I don't want to diminish anyone's talent, but in the, in sort of what you are likely to encounter in your working life with the best of them. Uh, if you just apply yourself, right? It's not, it's not magic. Um, so, so sort of the, the first trans, you know, the, the first thing was I actually really enjoyed network engineering and I had a, you know, got pretty senior in that and sure security was interesting to me, but once you've invested in a career, you don't want to start over. So I always said, oh man, you know, I'd love to work in security, but I'm not going to like start over in a sock. I'm already doing this. And uh, as I sort of moved into Netscaler and got more into like hobbyist uh, robotics and stuff like that, I was writing more code. I kind of saw this intersection with what I was doing in, in code. And because I had this strong network engineering background, I would sometimes encounter developers who had sort of less domain expertise in networking. And so I kind of got this rivalry thing where it's like, well, I understand how to write code and I understand how to write networking. Like, could I write this code? Uh, and then when I, you know, worked in, in, in support, you know, there were opportunities for us to write diagnostic tooling. So I volunteered. I volunteered to work on the diagnostic tooling projects. I wrote, I just sat and wrote uh, like an implementation, you know, raw sockets, like packet capturing. I just wrote a bunch of code. I probably annoyed a lot of managers because I was just like, hey, look at this code I wrote. And they're like, why do I care about this? Uh, and then, so I, I volunteered a lot and I wrote a lot of code and, and, and ultimately th through working on that automation project, I joined a development team on a, in, in, the, in the support organization. And then I pivoted to a product development team. Uh, and so it was kind of, kind of chasing that piece, but all along as I'm doing all these other things, progressing from network engineer to network, you know, appliance developer, which was pretty cool. Uh, I kept saying like, oh man, security would be cool. I work on you know a lot of security stuff in the sense that Netscaler implemented a lot of security functionality, but I'm still like, oh, now I'm a I'm a principal software engineer at Citrix. Like I'm not going to restart my career in security. And then you know my buddy comes along and says, hey man, I got a senior role for you. And so it was just kind of luck again in, in that sense. But these were things that I had always been into security and were like, hey, I would I would jump on an opportunity if I could if I could get an opportunity to enter security at a senior level and like credibly do that. Uh, I would jump at that opportunity and, and sort of the, that was always there. Uh, but kind of my main goal was once I understood I could write code was then to become a developer and like, then like check that box off and complete that transition. And that was a lot of it. And so, yeah, it was kind of those two things coming together in the Bay area that ultimately led me then to security leadership. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah. So what I took from that is one, like, you were intentional and worked hard to make it happen. It wasn't an accident. Uh, and the other is you were like getting into development uh, and maybe you weren't as good as some of the other developer peers, but there was specific areas that development was happening in, which you had huge domain expertise in, which they didn't have. So um, I guess to, to abstract this away to me, it's like, oh, if you have a certain level of expertise in some area and you're trying to get into a new area, like, can you do some work in that new area which will benefit from the expertise you already have. So in your case, writing like network appliance software or networking stuff, which, uh, yeah, you can be a great developer, but you might not know, like, I don't know, TCP IP in detail or, or things like that. Um, right. So yeah, that's cool. Um, awesome. Well, thanks so much. Uh, okay. So let's uh, quickly chat a little bit um, about like high level security of Snowflake, and then we can get into uh, sort of security defaults and, and things like that. So. Uh, you know, just quickly at a high level, uh, you know, what was security at Snowflake like when you first joined? Uh, and then how is it today? How has it uh, evolved? Of course, security is, is not just AppSec and secure defaults, which I feel like is kind of the default context we're talking about here. And I'm sure everybody knows this, but like, you know, there's incident response, there's other things that are going on. So there's like a relatively small security team, but as it comes to the product, there are essentially, you know, Two, two people really working on this to secure features. There's the founding security architect, and there's one sort of security engineer who's doing basically all, all of the pen testing. And when I joined, uh, you know, essentially the, the founding security architect was making many of the security decisions, uh, which, which I thought was, you know, that's great. I'm, I'm, you know, working with the folks who's made all of the core decisions and were involved in every decision that gets made. So like from a basics perspective, it's like, oh good, we have really strong, security culture. Uh, of course, the challenge was going to be was going to be scaling that, right? It, it couldn't just be us three. Um, and so then, 
in the beginning there were there were three and then it became you know 35 later uh at least from the product focused part of things and how uh, how long did it take to go from three to 35 so it, it really did take about three years and i think in basically the last you know in this year we almost doubled and you know i'm, I'm not sure that i see us necessarily doubling a, a, again we've expanded you know, Snowflake exists in, in Warsaw, we have a global presence. So that's been a focus area for us is getting a global presence going. Um, but I think like in terms of ratios and things like that, we're in a pretty good place. But I think the kind of the, the biggest thing that changed in those three years, not just headcount was a transformation from like, a, hey, it's an AppSec team to uh, like a, a product security and abuse vertical. Uh, so then it's focused for us on the Snowflake product. Like we own the security posture uh, along with the rest of the product or of the Snowflake service. So, you know, then it kind of breaks down into uh, maybe, you know, uh, six six domains, let's say. The architecture, we want to incept policy. We want to define requirements. And we want to do things like focus on driving big picture security posture for the product. Like what, what is it? You, you know, we do have a goal of kind of, you need to hold this all in your mind as a system and the system needs to exhibit properties. You can't just have like a bunch of widgets with emergent properties. Like you got to kind of do this on purpose. Uh, so that's the architecture piece. And then there's a partnership. Uh, and so these are things like, hey, let's do uh, service identity this way and let's couple it with secret storage this other way and let's do cloud permissions this other way and these things all work together, right? So this is kind of like big picture, kind of static. I don't want to say static because things are always changing, but relative to feature velocity, relatively static, right? So then the next piece is, is kind of like, okay, on top, the top of this security architecture foundation, many, many widgets, many features are, are being built. And some features are more dangerous than others and so, or, or more risky than others is how, how we look at it. And so then we're partnering with product architects and security engineers to define the secure architecture of, of high risk features. So when we think about something like uh, uh, Snowpark, right? This is our uh, Java and Python execution on Snowflake, right? This is obviously very risky. We're now gonna do code exec as a service. And so we're going to embed long-term. And in this model, we're going to, you know, we're going to enumerate, curate, and approve security requirements. And these are going to shape the design, right? We're going to make design decisions. And in fact, we're going to change them based on the things that, that we do, we do here. So that's what architecture focuses on is, is to draw the box, right? And engineering, I don't want to, you know, no one just colors inside the box. Everyone can draw boxes, but let's just assume through a combination of architects and, and engineers, the box has been drawn. And now we need to define, create, and, and, and oftentimes partner on implementations, right? And we kind of break this down into two areas. We have software engineers who do things like build us uh, secure frameworks and services. Uh, they build us things like um, anti-abuse capabilities, detection pipelines, and things like that. We have, and there's actually kind of no, no upper limit. They also build things like our developer portal uh, that we use for conducting security review and, and, and lots of other things. Uh, then we, the next group of people in engineering course are, are security engineers, uh, and they focus on things like software security engineering and, and cloud security engineering, and they partner with our architects on some of these high-risk features, and they partner with our assurance program to do more traditional AppSec type ap activities, uh, and that kind of leads us there. So we've got architecture, we've got engineering, we can incept the policy, we can create the implementation, now we got to be sure that that's being done, right, that, that the implementation met the requirements and that they're always being done. So we have an assurance arm, and this focuses on our developer focusing product, right, we talked about a security engineer focused product where we created and curated requirements to teams at strategic project support. Now in the assurance org, we create a product called developer driven security, which is all about those things which are not high risk, which is the vast majority of what Snowflake works on, right? So we want a developer operated machine that deals with that, that space, assurance runs that program. Uh, when we think about, hey, operationalizing the policies and, and building things on the cloud and software side of things, okay. And then finally, when we think about feature pen testing and sort of low level validation activities, we also think about this in assurance. And essentially we use, security engineers to implement a lot of this assurance functionality. Now, from here, you kind of leave the, the very, we've talked a lot about AppSec. A lot of this is the AppSec half of things. And now we kind of transition from here. It's like, okay, we did. What we really focus on, Clint, is producing repeatable, like data structure, you know, structured artifacts of all of these things that have happened. Because we believe we're operating a, a machine in the entire stack. So all of the 
good thinking. We've thought about what the architecture should be and how it's implemented should be directly fed into the threat detection, right? So all that good work we've done in a structured and repeatable way is consumed directly by threat detection teams so that we can then create detections driven by the SPS process and the DDS process. And then what we couple that with is like a, a risk-based breadth first search uh, for technical debt, right? You can't, you know, if you just focus on feature production, then you're you're missing things, right? So it's it's multi-mode in that sense. There's a what we think is important is to be tightly coupled on at least one axis uh, with the rest of the processes uh, in in AppSec, and then right to have a way to discover the things which are not not going to be found that way. Uh, Clarification question. Um, so you mentioned uh, in your like architecture and sort of uh, threat modeling that uh, you uh, make sure there's a bunch of like artifacts from all these different security activities, which you said feed directly into threat detection. So can you be right. maybe more specific about what are those artifacts and yeah. how exactly do they? Because that's like, it sounds like a great idea, but I feel like the the interesting yeah. part is in like the the details here. Uh, you used a few acronyms, and I'm yes. curious if you could also say what yeah. those are. Just uh, yeah, so I, I, I can make sure I understand. Surely, yes. So SPS stands for Strategic Project Support. You can think about this as high risk projects, and then DDS stands for Developer Driven Security, which you can think about as low to medium risk projects. Right, those two buckets. And now what we can talk about is the artifacts that get produced as a standard within those two. We'll start with SPS. Uh, what a security architect will produce at the end of that after doing lots and lots of really great work is uh, something we call a product security requirements document. And what we document are the set of representative attack scenarios, right? For example, you know, uh, an attacker is going to escape the sandbox and pivot to another host, right? This is very generic, but essentially there's a document that describes for a given design, what we think the key attacker goals are going to be and how we think they're gonna carry those out. And then we rank them in, in order of likelihood and severity. And then we say, okay, as you work on this feature, these scenarios need to be mitigated by these release milestones, right? So for example, we think that if we have a you know, uh, remote code execution as a service, we think people will immediately try to abuse the APIs that we provide to them. So you need to have the sandbox in place before you have your private preview, right? Like this is a very uh, obvious example, right? But it's this kind of a thing. And so that, that's the unit. It's a, like a scenario of something we think is gonna happen, something we think an attacker will do, and then a, a priority of that. Uh, and the, the, the scenarios are like just in a Google Doc or like some yes, that's exactly Google right. Not not like JSON or YAML or something that's like automatically getting so sliced. We, we, yes, but it is first in a Google document, and that is a template, and then we can just strip the the text like we understand how to read that. The second unit is from from DDS, and essentially we've got a very similar thing. We don't think developers are are necessarily. To get them there, we think they need a lot more handholding. There's a lot of art and risk decomposition in this SPS thing we just described, which is why security engineers do it. So what we have developers try to do is, again, within the construct of their box, apply a pattern like, like stride to at least do a good search and then to have them ultimately implement a test plan, right? We want them to write a test plan. And so you can say again, oh, these are behaviors we want the system to exhibit. So in the, in the case of SPS, it's like, uh, risks we're worried about. And then we're saying, okay, now let's dream up the design that will mitigate. In, in DDS, we're doing a, a version of that, but it's kind of you're further along in, in, in the process. Uh, and so then you're saying, okay, the system should do this. Uh, it, it should do authentication. It should drop, it should rate limit, uh, you know, requests from the internet, things, things like that. So what you end up with then is, we, we literally use Gherkin, and I'm not sure how long that will continue to be the case, but BDD scenarios generated by developers. And so, Either I hand my friends in threat detection a PSRD that says here are all of the risks and they say, oh great, here's the scenario, here's how we can detect it. They hand it to, the, to our pals in IR that say, oh great, here's how we can respond to it. It's a little trickier with DDS because these are much more granular and high density. And so what they do instead is take that in, they take each of them in and look at them in aggregate and say, okay, what are we seeing here? Here's the detections we think we should write. So there's a higher human touch here in the sense that someone has to inspect all of these very structured deliverables. Our original goal is to say like one for one, 
And not that there should be a detection at a one for one layer, but to be able to reason about them. But in reality, having a developer describe a stride based threat model and then mapping that directly to detections is like, it's not really what you're going to do. Like you're going to sort of group some things together and then you're going to have a set of meaningful detections that come from that. Uh, but for us, it was important to have any credible story about this really high volume set of activities, right? Uh, Developer-driven security is producing thousands of these reviews on a daily basis, right? And then to have any approach that said like, hey, we know how to do selection and we know how to start writing detections against that, uh, we think is pretty good. The SPS piece is much easier. This is highly curated by security engineers. We have a great process that's very repeatable, but it's much easier for someone in detection to sort of just take that unit and do it. And the time scales are much longer so that although we are starting to, you know, you got to scale that as well. So it's interesting to think about that, but with these, for every feature is, is our vision. Like there, and, 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 and if we say no, we, we should say no as well and document that fact. But it's like uh, we, our assurance machine gets in front of every feature and we take all of our friends with us on that journey uh, in front of every single feature. And then we make a decision about what, what should be done here. Yeah, and I, I think one thing uh, that strikes me as especially cool that I wanted to emphasize <laughs> is the um, taking, having for the low and medium risk issues, having developers uh, think of like, what are the security requirements? What are sort of the security user stories? And then uh, you said those are codified in uh, sort of a behavior-driven development or BDD way using Gherkin, which is a uh, common uh, sort of like Englishy uh, uh, testing framework that exactly. you can even specify the requirements in like uh, sort of like it should do this or right. should not do that. And uh, what I love about it is that is like both very readable and sort of intuitive, but also um, like the uh, a language and testing framework that uh, developers already use rather than uh, some separate security tool well, that is like totally, well, maybe they to don't burst, really use Gherkin. I hate to burst any bubbles on Gherkin, but yeah, ultimately no one, well, I don't wanna say no one uses Gherkin, somebody does, Clint, but what would, yeah, the value we get, we, the value we got from Gherkin was the language normalization. Like how do you get developers to consistently describe a thing in a way and because, and I know this is not the, the, tar, the, the topic of our podcast, but because we invested so much in automating and pre-suggesting what we thought developers should care about, then it was uber beneficial to have a language that lended itself essentially to templating. So we can essentially craft half-baked risk statements, like describing because flow goes from here to here, and we know the, the, the relative risk between those two areas, you can craft like a, a boilerplate statement that starts to describe this and then you can essentially prompt the developer to, it's like a Mad Libs, they kind of fill in the Mad Libs and, and then you get a pretty decent uh, set of BDD cases, right? And then, and then you do some peer review of that and then you have a test plan and then you're moving on to trying to automate that test plan and assert that those along with every other test. See, the case we're trying to make here is a test is a test is a test. These are not, you are your tests, right? And put our test cases with your tests, please, you know, is how we kind of think about it. So. I often counsel my team that like, don't don't get married to Gherkin because they don't use it, right? But what they do is write test plans. And so then we, what we can talk about is, well, what we really care about here is describing these in a consistent way because here's the constraints that exist on our system uh, now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I guess Gherkin is just an implementation detail, but I, I do like that you've attempted to make uh, creating the test plan easier, uh, repeatable, and more consistent right. for developers by, uh, I think you you told me about this previously, where you have like a, a form or like sort of a mini questionnaire where it's like, what kind of things are you doing? What's involved in this uh, feature change? And then right. it basically takes the output of that and like, uh, yeah, to use your point, as like a Mad Lib search against like, here's our database of known uh, like, tests that you should do right requirements we say we say what team are you on what are you working on and then we say hey here's here's gherkins that have been tagged with that context and like here's all of them like can you meet them all does your system meet them all right and, the, and this is kind of the the security requirements that we then try to say then deflects a future threat model you don't actually want a threat model it's it's in the absence of a security requirement for your design and team that you need to threat model but once you've created it like you should fill it back in the machine and then like show it to yourself later and say, oh yeah, remember when we did that thing to solve that particular threat? Uh, yeah. Yeah, which I think is great because I think um, thinking of 
like threat modeling and the things you should do in avoid or from like sort of a blank page uh, syndrome sort of way. It's like, that's, that's a lot of work. And I feel like it's easy to miss things, but if you have right. sort of a, an auto complete, if you will, of like right. four things like you, here's 50 things people have done before. Right. And you're like, uh, you're like, oh yeah, these 10, these are clear. And you're like, oh, I didn't think about that one, but like, I should do that one. And it's just, right. I feel like it takes it from maybe a daunting amount of work to a manageable amount of work, hopefully. I think so. And then I think you have to make the investment also in that that latter piece, because even when they, even when a developer comes to do the threat model, we really thought long and hard about like, well, what's a developer good at? Developers good at, they know in their mind the model of their system. So not every developer draws a diagram. That's, that's no flake they do. <laughs> but like developers are good at drawing diagrams. Let's just say it. Like whether you bust it out on a napkin or, or do it in a structured way, like they're good at describing what their system does. And so then we thought like, well, how do I give you 80% of what you need to, to do what I want using 100% of what you've already done, right? So you draw me a picture of your system, which you're good at. I'm going to ask you to apply, you know, the, the RTMP, uh, rapid threat model prototyping process, not mine, didn't, didn't invent that, but it scores things zero to nine. Give me your diagram, score it zero to nine using some simple rules that I taught you. And then I'll give you 80% of your test plan, right? And I'll, 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 I'll structure it for you. I'll give you all the boilerplate. I'll, I'll describe to you the things. And I just want you to complete it. I want you to get it peer reviewed. And I want you to be, basically our thesis was, I want to free your mind to think about the remaining 20% of interesting cases and to quality control the 80% cases, not to just click the button. Although I will say that is a huge risk we take by doing this. Like if, it, if it's so easy, then, then don't they just go through it? You know, these things happen. But what I'll say is you look at the principles you want, which is, I want to give them 80% of it with very little effort. And, and I think that anyway. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, yeah, I really uh, enjoyed uh, chatting with you previously about like, how do you scale threat modeling in an org? And uh, we did, uh, we can maybe include this in the video notes, but we did uh, write a blog post together, 99% uh, yep. you uh, about how uh, Snowflake has attempted to sort of scale threat modeling and like, what were the different approaches? And what I liked about it was it's sort of a story where it's like, we thought this would be great and we started doing it and then like, ah, like this didn't work and it like this part of it totally failed and you're like, okay, so then we did this next thing to try right. and make it better. And then there was sort of a series of like uh, examples of like, yeah, even very smart, well-intentioned people are gonna stumble a few ways, uh, a few places along the way. And like, here's right. sort of like how we iteratively with heavy developer feedback made it into a system that is um, hopefully minimally frictionful uh, to people, right. but also effective from a security point of view. So yeah, right. we'll link to that. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought that post was uh, so fascinating to read uh, and I loved it. To kind of, so we got, sorry, to just close like the stack, we're almost, we're almost at the end. So we had threat detection, we had IR, we talked about like how all of this is tightly coupled, which we really like. Uh, we're getting, we're good at it for TD. We're getting much better at it for IR. We can feed it with SPS. It's a bit hard to think about how to feed IR with DDS right now in the same way we couldn't first think about how to feed TD threat detection with DDS to begin with because it was so high volume. Eventually we figured it out. So I think eventually we'll figure it out for IR as well. But what I'm really proud of is with SPS, you know, I, I often think Clint uh, in, in development, it's like we have this really nice interface, right? It's like really highly curated. Everybody understands it. Everybody understands how to use this API. It does a really good job of invoking stakeholders and representing their interests in a structured way back to other stakeholders, diverse stakeholders, product managers, engineering decision makers, and ultimately translate all of these opinions into something that guides you know, big decisions in terms of when we'll release and, and what it will do. So I, I think that's pretty cool. The, the last bit is, of course, once you've got, you know what to build, you know what to look for, you know how to respond. Of course, then you want to look for the things you missed. Uh, and that's kind of the adversary simulation, uh, red team, offensive security, whatever you want to call that. But this is kind of to close the, the not, not that it's the end, but if we think about it in a circle, maybe this is sort of the, the last end of the circle is, ha we're, we're so smart, we thought of everything. And then and then the red team hands you the, the list of things you missed and you feed that right back into the top. You start again at architecture and say, okay, what did we need to change about the architecture? And we kind of go around and around forever on this journey. Uh, and I think it's a nice virtuous cycle. Uh, so long as all of these pieces are aligned and everything nicely, more or less feeds from one phase to the next phase. Yeah, yeah. You said there was also like 
corporate security, like the IT related things. Yeah. So yeah, there are many groups of things which uh, we have not discussed at all here, uh, but can uh, another time perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say in general, what we do is kind of a part counterpart and, and I have sort of um, senior resources in TD and IR, but when we want to scale for Follow the Sun for specifically TD and IR, we have a global security team that staffs that. And so essentially we lead kind of the strategic research and direction, and then we get scale through other teams. Uh, for some of our functions. And so it's anyway, uh, and we're all sort of uh, here to represent the interest of our respective organizations. We report inside of them. I, I report in the product org, uh, my, my counterpart in corporate security reports under that org. And so we get to where, you know, that's a nice place to be, right? I'm, I'm here to advocate for the interests of product, right? Uh, and then we coordinate ourselves under global security. And that's sort of like a situation we imagined ourselves and sort of arranged. So I think it creates accountability. It creates, I think, healthy tensions and sort of mitigates perverse incentives. So I kind of like the structure overall that we've taken. Yeah, can you tell me more about what sort of um, perverse incentives you think could occur if the organizational structure was different? I Just think like siloing is so, siloing is the biggest, and I don't know if it's a classic perverse incentive, but like self-interest being a perverse incentive like that, we would uh, prioritize self-interest over the interests of Snowflake in general. So what we wanted to have was you know, we, we basically just said as a group of leaders, oh man, we've seen so many security teams that are in silos, especially corporate and product security teams that have nothing to do with each other. And like, oh, we think, well, you know, those are the companies that get breached. How do we not do that? Like it wasn't super revelatory or, or groundbreaking, but it was just that basic thing. We we're like, how do we make it so that there's not an incentive towards siloing? How do we, how do we like force people to work together? And, and perhaps how do we make sure that they fail if they don't? Because you know that might actually be the right, the right move. Like if you if you can't operationalize it, then it should fail quickly and we should all get fired and, and Snowflake should move on to a you know to another set of leaders. Good thing I, I think we made the right choice. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I like that. How do you force people to work together and having product security under the broader like product and engineering um, so that your peers are not like this outside foreign entity that's like forcing them to do things they don't want to do, but it's like, oh, that's, the, like that's, that's the key psychological advantage, Clint. And I cannot, you know, I mention this to people and I always try to see how much they appreciate the psychological value. I think so much of security is psychology, but like it's such a small shift to not be an other. And the amount of time we talk about like leaning so hard on that, like, getting militant about not using the word security in our documentation and things like that. Like we don't exist. Like we're just product engineering. Like this is just what product engineers do. I think that's like such a powerful mindset. And if like, you really believe it, you can achieve a lot of things too. I think if you just, people have a naturally averse reaction to security and compliance. I'm like, then just don't be that, you know, there's not a reason, especially for us, what we've thought a lot about is, okay, let me tell you about the piece that you own that is just software engineering. So anyway. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I like uh, security programs that are like, well, really, if you're just writing high quality, robust software, that is also secure software. Like, <laughs> uh, like if you think about it, I think like software quality or correctness, if you were to do like a Venn diagram is like this, and then security is like a subset of that. I would, exactly. I would argue it's it's not like Venn diagrams that overlap, it's actually a subset. I, I completely agree. For a security person to go and make those statements to their peers in engineering, it's like, it, it actually builds some credibility. Like people should ingratiate themselves. Like, yes, it is that. We're not, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're just a part of quality, but that also means that like, hey, you reason about performance, you reason about scalability, like, what do you mean you don't reason about security risks? And so then you can sort of flip that uh, because you are just a part of quality. And then you can appeal to the developer psyche, which is, of course, you don't say it this way, but like, don't you want to be a great developer? Aren't you a great developer? Great. You know what, you know what a good developer does, right? You know, and so then it, it, it just, it's a different way to approach this. Uh, and I don't think anybody should be demeaning or, or say things about you, want, you know, but I think it's important to approach it from that perspective of like, this is what developers do. And, and I, I was counseling a, a team member of mine the other day and some of the ways we communicate is like, assume a little bit that developers do that. And when you sp speak to them, like, don't tell them, like, assume that they do those things and kind of write from that perspective of like, of course you write tests. So here's some best practices for tests that I know you're super interested in. And by the way, some of these deal with security testing, right? Uh, so yeah, yeah, I like that. And um, in many companies, once you get to a certain size, there's 
say a, a performance team or a developer productivity team right. or so like every developer cares about you know software quality performance obser observability like all these things there's some sort of like meta properties about the software that you want and what uh, i just thought of uh, as you were saying that is you know if we're considering security a part of writing good code then i would almost put it as like sort of a uh, a sister or like a brother function to these other groups where, right? So it's like you've got product teams building new features. You have maybe your observability team or your reliability team or your like performance. Like there's sort of these niche teams that specialize in some area. And if you think about it, product security could just be another one of those things that's like, hey, everyone is responsible for this, but we are going to be domain experts in this and help you with that function. That's right. Uh, because part of the broader like software quality um, uh, family. I That's guess. right. We're going to convince you that you own it, and then we're going to make you successful in, in doing so. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, OK, cool. So one, uh, actually, very much along these lines, uh, uh, sort of a big topic I wanted to get into is uh, we can start high level and then getting into the details. But yeah, curious uh, what your thoughts are on um, uh, some terms that are perhaps a bit overloaded, uh, but secure defaults or secure guardrails or sort of paved road as uh, Netflix and some other companies call it. Um, so yeah, I guess first maybe like what do those mean to you and how do you think about them? And then we can maybe delve into what does it mean at Snowflake in particular uh, after yeah. that. So I guess at its, at its base, and I think I learned most of this from reading your slides, which until like a, a week ago, and maybe I shouldn't tell you that I unbookmarked them, but literally Clint for three years, <laughs> Uh, uh. <laughs> the 10x PPT like literally sat in my bookmarks bar, always visible for for three years. But but anyway, no, I, I I you know it is about curation and paved roads at the very highest level. It's like you know you don't need to be overly specific, but it's that there's a few ways to do things, and I guess you could say there's sort of like more or less choice in whether or not you're going to do it one of those few ways. Uh, and it is sort of the opposite of do whatever you want, right? So it, to me, it's about being opinionated. And then I feel like uh, there's a there's a definitely a spectrum of like how good you are at being opinionated and driving adoption and things like that. It's like it's like it's, it's a different game at that point, right? If you decide you're going to be opinionated and reduce choice, then you want to drive adoption of choice, and then it becomes like a, a different problem. You want to start to prioritize things like user experience. So I think it can really impact the whole thing. In fact, you could say secure default, like DDS, that whole thing we just got done talking about, you could say is like some version of a secure default and, and we built a product that lets developers do it really easily. But I think what 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 mostly I think about is, is you know probably at the lower level that most people think about this, which is like, okay, developer builds a thing, they write code and what are the components they use when they write that code? So what functions do they call? What frameworks do they call them? in and sort of the other side of it is maybe like what cloud resources do they deploy them on uh and what are the like uh safe arrangements of what is what is a safe s3 bucket what's a safe ec2 instance to the degree that that can exist um so i think you know for for now i'll talk a little bit more i guess about the 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 software side of of things um of course the infrastructure yeah, but, uh far away. Before you get into it, uh, I have a bunch of thoughts and questions, but oh, okay. I think the most, pressing, the most pressing one is, uh, yeah, why did you want a book market? What, uh, what happened? Oh, well, I just, you know, I don't know, Clint. <laughs> oh, I feel like you're putting me on the spot. I felt like, you know what? I have like a, I meet with this guy weekly. I'm like, I, I think I know, Clint. I think I have a good relationship. Like, I don't know if I have to have it in the bookmark bar, but now you're making me you're making me feel bad, so probably I'll just restore that so that I'll no, 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 never no, don't, forget. Don't restore it. <laughs> I, no, I, I think no, I was actually good. just pruning the whole bookmark bar, and maybe I finally felt Clint. You know, my imposter syndrome had finally diminished enough, Clint, where I felt like, hey, maybe I learned from Clint what he had to teach me. So there's that, and I said, okay, I can. I've arrived <laughs> at your level, Clint, or at least you know at the at the feet of your steps. So, <laughs> yeah, I I think uh, a lot of my thinking on this stuff has been uh, greatly shaped uh, by you and your like hands-on experience uh, at Snowflake and other places. It's so uh, funny, man. This is what I love about just research and doing. None of it, you know. And what I always appreciated about you, and this is not for us to just like thank each other, but like. I feel like you're really good at meta analysis, and I feel like I've always been good at meta analysis, and like we're. 
we're hardly doing anything more than just like looking at what other people have done, applying it. And then because we've decided to apply it or try it, then you get to iterate it. And then like naturally it leads to progression. And it's like, it's not more than that. It's just like, I made a decision and maybe you did too, to like, Hey, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to, this is what we're going to try. And like, I'm willing to fail trying it or I'm willing to improve it. Cause like, anyway, this is all I care about is trying to build like a world-class AppSec program. And here's all these smart people who thought about it and here's how it could look. And actually no one knows. Uh, and that's kind of exciting too. Yeah. I think one of the most fun things to me is when we first uh, started hanging out and chatting and you were like, okay, cool. I want to do like threat modeling at scale. Uh, and then you were like, so here's this like um, uh, extensive survey of like everything anyone has ever said about like modern threat modeling that you're like, okay, there was, you know, uh, this talk by this person at this conference, there was this, there was this, there was like this approach, this approach. And um, you just had clearly put in like significant um, time into doing like your background research to understand a space in detail and both how it's uh, started and how it changed over time. And to me, uh, like that's my jam. So <laughs> when you- oh, well, uh, I wonder how many people know there's like a university study on threat, model, threat modeling approaches. Like it's not the, the greatest one, but like that's there. And I don't, I don't know how many people just like sit down and look like, hey, is there research or, or to try to create it? Cause I think that's another opportunity in security. There's a lot of things we do that don't have any research and like, hey, you can just start some of your own, you know, read talks, as you said, that, that seems to be like the number one research happens in the wild and you hear about it through these talks and what people write about. Yeah. Most of my thoughts and views on things uh, have largely been just from like conversations I've had with sharp people and uh, things I've read. Uh, I would say, yeah, I feel like few of my ideas are original. They're more just like distilling or combining ideas uh, that have happened from very smart people uh, who are not me. Yeah, I think the fallacy, Clint, is believing that like being smart is not that. Like, I think a lot of people think they need to have original idea. Like. I don't know, man. You just like get exposed to stuff and get your hands dirty and you can do a lot. I don't know, man. I think a lot about people's perceived barriers to success. Like people th think it's something else. But the key thing I've realized over my career is like nothing. You just do it. Like just start doing it. And you either will or won't do it. And if you don't, don't be too sad about it. And if you will, then like continue to do it and you'll get better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will briefly continue this digression uh, and then we we'll come back into it. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, just what you said with like the just do it, uh, I think really uh, stuck out to me. Uh, just, yeah, Shia LaBeouf, just do it. Uh, yeah, that which, video. <laughs> uh, but yeah, pe people periodically ask me like, like, Clint, how do you do, you know, TLDR sec every week? How do you have like a newsletter? How have you like built this thing? And uh, I'm like, easy, just spend, you know, 15 to 25 hours a week reading articles and then write about it. And then, you know, step one, do that. Step two, do that for like three years. And then, wow, like so, surprisingly now, now you have a thing. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, magic or anything special. It's just spending more time than most people are willing to spend and doing that for longer than people are willing to do. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it, it's basically what I've done. It, it's That's a, exactly it, but, and I feel like the more- More people, of attrition. Yeah. Endurance is the other way I describe it to my team all the time. Like that's it. It's just, and you hear this from pro athletes too. And I just feel like people, it's hard for them to hear. It was hard for me to hear this advice, which is like, no, they just wake up earlier and work harder than you. And that's, that's, there's of course a lot of other factors, you know, let's not ignore those, but in many cases, if you compare two apples, it, it really is that it's like, which apple wakes up earlier and works harder. Uh, and, and that's it. I, uh, I'm not a big uh, sports person in general, but I did watch The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary uh, oh, recently. Okay. I haven't quite finished it, but yeah, basically it was like, this guy is like training before practice. He works the hardest in practice. And when everyone's gone home, he like shoots baskets for like two more hours. And he just right. did that for like his entire life. Right. Um, and right. I was like- It's so simple at that point. You're like, oh yeah, if you practice that much, you probably would be the best. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. and, and to be fair, obviously like genes and a bunch of other things come into it. Not anyone could be Michael. You've got to be tall. You've got to be able to build muscle. But but right. yeah, it was just like this but guy- But amongst was those people, like, that's the difference. Yeah. So we, we talked a little bit about uh, secure defaults and paved road. And I think one of the things you emphasized was uh, a lot of it is- removing options and having like a standard way to do things, right. um, which I would argue is also, um, if you're in a high performing engineering culture, you probably do something similar, right? If you're right. writing software at Google or somewhere, they're like, 
this is how we do X. Like we just, our build pipelines work like this. So you use these libraries or you, you do whatever. Um, so I think there's still like a tie in with like development uh, best practices, but I'm curious now to get maybe a bit more specific, like, yeah, tell me a bit more about like how that's gone at Snowflake and uh, maybe some of the challenges, some of the successes, just, yeah, a bit, a bit more into the weeds. Yeah. Go going back to those early days, like every feature was a new thing. Like you, it was a new database feature. So you couldn't go to the OWASP top 10 and really meaningfully say anything about a given feature. So you then had to like look at it and think real hard and talk to developers a lot and like reason about permissions and invokers rights and owners rights and some other things. And so what this meant was that like, we felt like, oh man, to secure this thing, you really have to make a big design time investment. Like you're not going to static, like lint your way out of this. You're not going to statically analyze. That doesn't mean people are not writing bugs that could be caught with static analysis and other things. But like our, the big existential dread was these business logic bugs and they're hard. Like this is what's going to show up. It is, it is not going to be cross-site scripting mostly. Uh, it's not going to be SQL I and things like that. It's going to be a flaw in the permissions model, a flaw in the role, the way roles are used or, or, or something like that, right? So, so, right, that meant we had a big, big investment in secure design. And in fact, earlier in the, in the discussion, we talked a lot about sort of some of that machinery, but it, it, it's, a, it's a big machine that produces artifacts about it. It's a developer-driven machine that, that creates requirements for new designs via threat models. And then next time kind of, contextually curates them back to developers. So all this machinery is designed to optimize that design time investment, right? Like, okay, let me show you everything we've seen so that before you build this thing, we can be confident that you built it correctly, right? But then our ability to verify that it's built correctly is, is more difficult. But we say, okay, well, if we produce structured things, then maybe we can try to verify them, verify those structured things. So, so um, like I said, we consolidate that into a test plan. Um, I'll just briefly digress for, for a second. You know, so you got the, you show the developments, the, the developer, the requirements uh, for the use case they're working on. They produce that unit, which is this behavior, behavior driven design statement about what secure behavior is expected. We consolidate that into a test plan. We look for ways to automate that continuous validation. And teams like this because as they feed this machine, they threat model less, the risk goes down, they go faster, they release with less barriers. And so the loop is like, hey, if you feed the machine, if you invest in this machine that we gave you and you feed it requirements, it will show them to you at the right time later so that you can avoid going to threat modeling and so that you can lower the risk of your projects faster because essentially security requirements mitigate risk is, is the basic setup yeah. here. Yeah. So that. Do, you, do you want to be able to ship quickly and not get delayed on security reviews in the future? Well, right. if you put in a little bit of time now, you're going to save yourself, like your, your launch isn't going to get delayed. You're going to be able to push faster. Right. Like there's all these benefits to you in uh, investing a little bit here and there uh, over time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Back, back to you. Yeah. I like that. So then we thought, well, okay, we got this thing that produces these structured things. And so we thought, okay, well, secure defaults, we we're struggling to think about what to tell them in terms of like, we know they do things like implement permissions and we know that we have to threat model them. And we know that. At, at, at that moment, we can create these secure secure defaults, but you know some of them are more or less good at being expressed as SAS rules. Many of them are unit tests. Many of them are integration tests, and some of them really can only be tested, you know, manually. Uh, and so, um, our our first idea was to try to get these developers to write SIMGREP rules encapsulating these these behaviors. But in practice, they were challenging to capture. But what we were trying to do as a side effect of that was gather up enough of these behaviors so that we could do a second pass filter and say, hey, uh, how do these behaviors group? Like what, are, like, what are the commonalities amongst security requirements? And then our thesis was, if you start to squint at that, you'll start to get ideas about what frameworks are missing, right? We knew that there were basically no frameworks. Like it's just raw permission editing, raw whatever editing. We don't even know how to secure it well. So first we got to figure out how to get people to describe how it's supposed to be secured. Then we got to gather up enough of these descriptions into a meaningful unit where we can say, okay, now let's invent a secure default, right? So this is like years of work that we're now projecting and we're starting and we're saying, okay, developers, try to write some rules 
based on these test plans we gave you. Try to implement as many of these rules as you can, as sim rep rules, as many of the test cases, as sim rep rules as you can. And just like in practice, that turned out to be really hard just because it's not, it's not always a good fit. And like the level of abstraction they're writing the scenario is not always close to the level of abstraction that's needed to express that as a sim rep rule, right? So that's like a, a very practical challenge. Quickly, uh, just just to uh, before you move on, just to sort of uh, uh, yeah. put a pin in a few things that I think are very interesting. So the first is uh, Snowflake is a database company, like building basically a database product. And yes, you have web applications, but fundamentally, you're not just a generic SaaS web app company. So correct. Uh, where for those companies, it's like, yeah, you've got OWASP top 10, you've got very standard frameworks for like, these are the type of issues you look for. But for Snowflake, it's like, well, there's no database OWASP top 10. Right, um, there's no like, React there's for database development. You know what I mean? Or, or, yeah. or some common framework that's like, oh, it's all, all bells included uh, and it's safe. Like we, we have to invent those things. Yeah, so I think that's very interesting. And then uh, like the other thing I wanted to highlight is you um, rather than saying, oh, here's some secure default libraries or infrastructure we should build, uh, just sort of, uh, you know, coming straight from your brain or sort of the head of Zeus. Instead, you were like, okay, we have this process where uh, developers are filling out, you know, these forms, we're getting security requirements and security test cases that should be there. And then you just do that for a while. And then you basically from that from the output of the threat modeling, you sort of squint and group those and categorize them into buckets. And you're like, okay, here's the classes of things that keep coming up again and again. Right. These are the things we should invest in because we can see them happening the most rather than like you throw a, a dart at a dartboard and you're like, I guess right. we're gonna build one of those. Um, right. So anyway, uh, yeah, feel free to, sorry to interrupt, go back to Oh, that, it actually makes a lot of sense because it's about yeah. that reduction and elimination of classes. If a class, of security requirements existed and it was 10, then I would love to be able to eliminate that class with one, right? So it just, so long as you're generating requirements and thinking of them, it's just like you're trying to group them and then consolidate them. So the developer has to think progressively less about what they're doing. Like one fine day, they're just gonna select their use case and we're gonna be, you know, show them the use case machine. And it's like, here you go. You know, uh, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but like, that's, that's where we're trying to get to is like, there's just one button you click and you, and you can't screw it up. Yeah. Then um, make it secure button. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But I think there's a, you know, I think it's good to have ridiculous goals. Uh, and I don't want to say it's ridiculous to think there's a secure button. I think that's really, really hard. And I'm not convinced that like you should invest all the way to the secure button, but I think like you should build some of them. And like you said, I think having a data driven approach is important because we could have a whole other podcast about my feelings on shooting from the hip as security engineers and how we shouldn't do that. But, but right. You, you, ultimately, our thesis was that we don't know. The developers know. So let's crowdsource. And we do this in a couple of different places. And in this case, you know, it, it, I think it cost us a little bit of time because we didn't, we didn't really think hard enough about what we were trying to crowdsource and whether or not the crowd could successfully give us what we needed. Right. So so, right, in this case, we said, okay, let's crowdsource this first set of rules and, and these requirements. And while, while they gave us the requirements, they, they struggled to give us the rules. And so then I guess the way I would want to think about it, and, but that's not to say we didn't get any. We got some high value ones around permissions and like calling conventions around that, other things we expected to see. So like there were some teams that were better than others, but we didn't get like mass adoption or mass production of these things, right? So then we kind of said, oh, okay, well, how can we reapproach this? And I think maybe there's like a, a spectrum of secure defaults. So there's like low level things like everyone should parse XML and JSON the same way. Then there's a more high level thing, kind of like what we were talking about, which is like uh, when you implement a permission, here's the here's the framework you use to do that in a foolproof way. And then kind of in between that is like uh, when you use the, when you implement a permission, which is always high risk, like here, make sure you use this calling convention, this other thing and check to make sure you did this. Basically, there's like a bunch of rakes and knives around and we just kind of make sure you didn't step on them. But like, it's still pretty possible because you haven't invented the thing that eliminates all the rakes and knives by, by default, right? So that's kind of maybe in the middle of the spectrum. And that's where we targeted first, right? And then we're like, oh, not so much success. And then we tried to kind of go backwards, but but in sort of the early days of, of Snowflake, we hadn't invested yet as much into this concept of, well, security wants to curate developer experience. Like you said, that's not our idea. Like smart development teams want to curate their experience, right? Because as you scale, you want to streamline and, and, and um, 
you know, build teams and others don't want to support all these bespoke things the, the same way that security doesn't want to, but we've not made that investment yet. And so then that meant each team, many teams had their own way of doing things. And again, that made it hard for us to work across the teams to move the bar up. So like to even go and sort of have a conversation, like you have this first conversation with them about writing static analysis rules for their security requirements. And then you sort of say, okay, we're going to put a pause on that. And then we're going to come back and say, okay, now everybody write rules for the parsing libraries you use and other things, but everybody uses a different one. And so like nobody is super motivated to do that. Right. And, and then the number of cases you need to track. And then, by the way, it's almost like a non goal to do that. In fact, we would rather influence the organization to consolidate so that we would be in a better position. So it's like getting the low hanging fruit wasn't that opportune because at that time we didn't have the investment in, in, in DPE or rather developer productivity. And so, um, you know, we just didn't make as much as much progress as we thought we would. And so I guess. The, the key thing we learned over time was in hindsight, taking this very like, we're not domain experts, we're gonna crowdsource this, we're just gonna use developers was overly optimistic. I think we asked them to do too much and we had not done enough homework ourselves yet to really make that succeed at scale. And so I think what we learned is like, hey, security engineers. Um, and, and sort of one thing I didn't talk about is like, you know, we're, we got this whole vertical, all of these security functions we're implementing, like writing rules is so, and I don't want to diminish this for anybody. It's like one small part of what this team is working on. And what I'll say is if, if you treat it as just one small part, if it's 5% or 10% of somebody's day, that will not be enough. Uh, the, the key thing we learned was it needs to be almost a hundred percent of at least one security engineer's time. Otherwise you're not going to make progress on this, right? Not only will you not be like, even if you can coordinate the projects to ask developers to do it, like no one will know how to answer the questions. Like no one will know how to, how to do it. And that's really what we learned. And so we just said, hey, security engineers, one is really hard for you to start, really hard to be successful without developer productivity. We got a great investment in it. Really, that is like our biggest partnership. I cannot emphasize that enough. Get the org to invest in developer productivity or developer experience, and then like partner with that team. Uh, that, that's going to be the most important thing. And then we should get our hands dirty and say, okay, like here, here's what we can do and how we can do it. And so now we're kind of back at that point where there is a developer productivity team we can partner with. So we can start to look at curating some of these other options. Uh, and then what we did was hire more engineers to focus exclusively on this and say, like, hey, your charter and the success of the role is about driving the static analysis story forward. And I just think what's interesting is we finally arrived at a place in scale where like that, that was the, the thing to make. It's like, I often dreamed of a time where we would have a team focused on this. And I, it's not to say that I have a team focused on it, but like then one day we were like, no one works on this enough. We need people who only work on this, right? And then like, you're one step away from a team that only does this job. Uh, so I, I think, you know, those were kind of the things for us. Uh, some nuances of how we scaled using developers and then some nuances of how we staffed and resourced it, I think, uh, you know, made it made it a struggle for us to freeze what people were already doing. Now, that didn't really diminish the long play, which was get the security requirements, gather up the behaviors, and then propose the frameworks. And, you know, we did succeed at that. And that is sort of the other investment we're making now, which is like, hey, we can incept, you know, we have engineers today, software engineers who can produce uh, crypto APIs for use horizontally across the business, vault clients for use horizontally across the business. So we also uh, increased our ability to produce those things uh, ourselves. And so now we kind of have a, a list, like, you know, I had this, I was going over some notes the other day, I had an angry list of secure defaults that weren't getting done. And I presented this to leadership and said, here's this 10X opportunity, we're still missing it. We haven't invested enough. Uh, and so we invested more and, and now, now we can bring those things. So that's, I guess, another learning is, you know, be ready to write the code yourself. Uh, it's good to partner with teams, but in many cases, especially these really horizontal efforts, you know, for example, vault clients and other things, um, these are good opportunities, I think, for security teams and software engineers on security teams to show up because it doesn't lean so much into the expertise of a single code base, right, which is what these, these individual product and software engineering teams really are always going to have on, on us, right? They, they know their code base better than anybody else, but providing services for them 
right? That just means understanding what they're working on. This is much more tractable. And I think something that security teams really need to invest heavily in. You need to have software engineers and you need to be able to, to ship the code and it needs to be production grade, the same as what everyone else in the business is writing. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, great insights there. One is that uh, I do hear this from a number of uh, who I would classify as sort of forward thinking um, either AppSec or ProdSec teams, which is they, you know, have like your canonical AppSec engineers with strong security backgrounds, but they're mm -hmm. also hiring software engineers as well to help really build things out. Um, so right. yeah, uh, you guys are doing that. I heard a number of other companies doing that as well, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Um, and yeah, another thing, uh, a semi-consistent challenge I've heard, with, which you called out, is like, you know, developers are busy. They have lots of responsibilities. They need to be shipping features quickly. And then for the security team to be like, cool, I know you have all those other responsibilities. Could I just get you to do like 20% more work without reducing your expected output from uh, your eng lead or like product lead or something? It's like, that's kind of... Um, uh, unfair to them, I would guess, in a way. Uh, I think we were, we were chatting before about like, yeah. Yeah, like if you're going to rely on developers contributing 10 or 20% of their time to being security champions or build whatever security related function, like ideally you need to get them to have like 20% less other responsibilities. So you're not right. basically ask, asking them to do like 120% work, like for you as a favor, right. uh, right. basically. And, um, and then yeah, the other thing that stuck out to me is, um, yeah, I, I have heard from a couple of companies like, yeah, developer productivity team, like these are who the security team should partner with. And so I, I love that uh, insight. And, um, and and I think it makes a lot of sense to go back to some of our earlier conversation about um, uh, security as one of many cross-cutting concerns, right? So for one development team, they're like, yeah, like we parse XML or we do, um, I don't know, some sort of gRPC stuff. Like, yeah, let's just do like just enough that um, it yeah. works and it fulfills requirements. But, you know, across many teams, it might take more effort than is worth it for any one of those teams to implement it. But if there is like a cross-functional team who's like, I'm going to make every team better, uh, like the developer productivity team, like, yeah, they're gonna like super over engineer that thing to make it like wonderful like developer experience so that it makes everyone faster and better. And uh, right. yeah, I would say, yeah, security is just like the other, the security version of that. That's um, right. Like one question I had for you is I, I wonder, um, could you or did you perhaps build rapport with the developer productivity team by saying like, hey, because uh, they, they have a similar challenge in that they're like, I'm going to build the best way to do this thing, but they still need to get teams to use it, right? There's still an adoption problem. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could use uh, either SendRep or just any tool to basically say like, hey, we're going to help you get visibility into who's using your approach and not, and maybe make it easy for them to say like, cool, uh, you know, we built this new way to parse XML. We've got like 30% adoption. Okay, in a month, now we're at 50% adoption and maybe even like automatically recommend to people, um, mm -hmm. for example, in like the PR workflow, like, hey, it looks like you just started parsing this XML or or maybe it's off, maybe it's whatever, but just yep. like XML is like one, one example of being like, hey, you're, I see you're using like Java standard library to do this. Did you yeah. know we built a wonderful tool for you? Like you should use this. So I, I guess I'm curious, like, uh, could you imagine, or maybe did you like offer your code scanning plan and almost capability to the developer productivity team in order to be like, Hey, we're going to make you better at your job. And oh yeah, by the way, there's like security benefits, but really this yeah. is a common capability that benefits both of our teams. And like, we're in this together. So first I wanna call out some thought leadership on, on your part here, Clint, which is like absolute pro move to approach it that way. Like it, it's, it's that uh, you don't have a security problem. You have a, you have a development problem. Like you create things and you want to drive adoption of them, right? It's not that, like, we're not here to do security better. Like, let me tell you about a shared problem that we have, right? Shared, shared problem, shared suffering. This is the key. So yes, I, not that exact thing, but like, did I explicitly partner with the developer experience team and talk about my capabilities, both in static analysis and otherwise, 
Absolutely. And the key thing we did was we really knew that developers were struggling to get from prototype to production. And we knew that we wanted to put security review behind a single pane of glass. And so we had a choice to make. Should we release the security review portal or should we go to DPE, tell them about not just our vision, but the developers clamoring for curated prototype to production and then figure out a way to build that together. There's only one answer, it's the other one. It's the one where you go with DPE and you do whatever amount of grinding, delaying, whatever you have to do to go together with them. And like, that is that is like the success criteria of the engineer I gave this is like, this is strictly an influence operation. It is not a success unless DPE is 1000% aligned with everything we do. And that if we stop working on it today, like they'll pick it up and carry it on without us. Um, so definitely we gave them developers to launch the developer portal under that shared vision. And we're every single quarter, almost every day of every week, like checking and making sure like there's no drift here. There's no drift here because we cannot allow it to fracture into two approaches, right? We know as soon as that happens, we've lost. So wherever DPE goes, we go, but we also wanna influence them, right? Uh, in a lot of ways. So that is the most important partnership. And I invest a ton of time and my team invests a ton of time uh, in, in maintaining that relationship, uh, and talking strategy, not just, you know, not just maintaining relationships, but like we have a shared vision. We're all passionate around developer productivity. And I think that's a really good place to be in. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. There's not a security dashboard and a developer productivity or a release right. dashboard or whatever. Like these are one dashboard. That's that, right. Uh, that's uh, right. We have everyone. That's right. We don't have, uh, I mean, now we do have Vuln dashboards, but you know, the ones we're most proud of are not. We have stability metrics that apply to production systems across many axes, right? And one axis of stability metrics is SLA performance for a given service, right? And so I don't send you a Vuln report. Like I'm part of the stability metrics that are already part of your engineering psyche, things that engineering is already incentivized to do well at. Right. Uh, so just kind of another way that we think about that. Like, I don't want to send you a security dashboard that shouldn't exist in most cases. So one thing I wanted to touch briefly on uh, that we spoke about before is how um, having a different culture and a different product, uh, like type of thing you're building, uh, both of those influence uh, maybe your approach to secure guardrails or secure defaults compared to say like a, a Facebook or a Netflix or some other uh, maybe consumer facing company or like a non, like uh, a more web app and not like yeah. data company. So I was curious, like if you could share just a, a few thoughts on that maybe. So some of the things I observed is that like um, some of the curated approaches were still optional. And I think one thing for us is like it's not optional. Uh, like we- It's optional we're... for these other companies who right. are- uh, say, uh, uh, like I think well, you, you mentioned Netflix, for example, they're like, yeah, here's a nice paved road for you, but it's still up to developers to do it or not. Right. It's it's still their choice. Uh, and that's not a knock against them at all, but like something that was fundamentally different and I feel like is a sacred a thing we care a lot about, a very sacred responsibility. And that sounds corny, but like, I'm very serious about this is it's not a choice. They don't have a choice. From day one, Everyone knew every security, every feature was going through security review. And that's like a great place for us to be in. But then that means you have to way over index on making sure that that's not terrible because you have all this buy-in. And so now it's it's yours to lose. So, and then the, the so, so there's that. And then the, the I guess the stakes are a bit higher um, in the sense that, um, well, okay, so the, so, so the first thing is, is right, everything is the same and we don't have like a loosely federated set of services that that kind of, uh, so I can have a, an API gateway that's really impactful because then every service doesn't need to think about auth or, or things like, I, I don't have those problems. I have like database permissions, cross account sharing and, and these kinds of problems. So it becomes difficult because the layer of abstraction we're operating at is not, for example, service to service communication or or some of these other things and there's not diminishing any of that and it's not about standing up new and different web apps it's about this other thing so then you know it's 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 a bit harder and it's a bit different uh in in that sense uh because you have to kind of figure this out um of course there are some patterns we use internally uh you know uh, identity and things like that but um and then kind of as we said earlier there's no there's no OAuth top 10 for dbs like we invent that kind of 
kind of every day. Um, and so, right, I just feel like, look, the, the, the business to consumer space, you know, everybody has seen, you just, there's a, there's a limit to how much you can be incentivized to security. And that's not to say that many of these people don't spend tons of money on security and do a lot of investment. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, Twitter getting breached again and losing this data is not going to end them because we, all that data has been lost before. Uh, you know, all of our personal data has been compromised many times over. So I feel like that's just a different risk calculation uh, versus a, a snowflake. And again, I don't, I don't want to like put us on a pedestal, but we're in regulated industries and it's, it's a much bigger deal for us. The data is, is, you know, well, we don't know. I mean, part of it is that we don't know. That's that's a big key of our security. But you know, we look at who's here, and these are this is the data that drives many businesses, right? The same way that Snowflake drives its business on data that we store in Snowflake. So these these things have catastrophic impacts. If 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 if, if Snowflake were to suffer a, a data breach, um, and so I just think it's a bit of a different a bit of a different risk profile uh, for B two B versus uh, kind of B two C, depending on what kind of data you're dealing with. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very good point, which uh, I found very uh, interesting when we were uh, prepping before this chat. Um, that I was like, oh, I hadn't uh, thought about it as much from that angle. But yeah, I think uh, both, like, yeah, the industry B two C versus B B two B, and what sort of data you have, uh, does make a big difference on how you approach uh, security in general. Um, right. So there's one thing uh, that I wanted to like quickly touch on uh, before we wrap up is um, uh, you have uh, some crazy ideas on uh code scanning and what you do with it and what your like vision for the future is so i wonder uh <laughs> this in itself could be like a whole discussion but yeah i wonder if you could share maybe a preview of some of the uh yeah just forward thinking like ambitious like this would be crazy uh but maybe it'll work uh sort of stuff you're thinking so i think we've always fancied ourselves smart enough to and like data driven enough, like we're a SQL company, everything we do is on a security data lake. So if everything is a security data lake, uh, what, what would you call it? I don't know, then I guess every, if all you have is a database, then everything's a SQL statement. But anyway, eventually you try to apply that, that model to your AppSec domain and you're like, hmm, what if everything were a database problem? And then you start to think about the code and you start to think about static analysis and it doesn't take long for you to think like, hey, what if I could query my code with SQL? Because that's what, what Snowflake does. And so years will go by and you'll see CodeQL get invented and, and you'll see uh, SEMgrep uh, come along and you'll really love that product and you'll adopt that. And you'll kind of put these dreams away for a while because, hey, essentially what you're talking about is my code is a data model I can query. And so then I don't need to be overly specific about how that happens. The power is the code is a data model I query. It's, it's, and you and I have talked so much about this. There's a difference between running rules and scanning them to my code is a data model that I query. And, and in its current form, SimGrep is a lot of rules against a target versus, so it, it has the primitives of code of, of my code is a data model. In other words, I can ask my questions of a single file easily in SimGrep. And if I want to ask it across a bunch of files, there's some glue that needs to be done today. And I know this is something you guys are working on. Independently of this, people smarter than me, specifically Greg Harris on our red team, he actually, so I never actually got, you know, I did some experiments and did some things, okay, the JSON output of tree sitter, but, and then that died. But what Greg thought was, hey, uh, by the way, uh, I want to do some red teaming stuff. And if I were ingesting all of the Git blobs into Snowflake, then I could get all of the repos together easily and, and keep them updated. And then I could run huge code-wide scans. Like in what Greg was interested in, we're finding secrets anywhere, right? In binary, in all kinds of places. And so that, that's what was nice about getting uh, all of the commit hash, getting all of the raw commit data and then just iterating over it. So actually the first thing he, he did was ingest all of the code, all of that Git repo data into Snowflake as, I don't know what file format Git is, but like as that, that's literally what's sitting in there. Uh, and then he started writing parsers because of course Snowflake is all about bringing code to your data. So then he started bringing parsers to it that would do the secret scanning. And he built this really fast, high performance secret scanner so that he could frustratingly find the secrets better than we could and then use them against us in, in red team activities. Uh, and so, you know, uh, <laughs> He's also built a similar thing with basically re-implemented, we ingest all the AWS and Azure and GCP, all that data as well. And he's basically 
re-implemented cartography on top of Snowflake using the same similar primitives to do graph traversal to find attack paths, which, you know, just another sort of interesting implementation. So then, then anyways, what, what Greg did was, uh, I'm trying to remember what, what vulnerability ultimately led him to want to do this. Um, anyway, I can't remember which one it is right off the top of my head, but essentially he knew a pattern that he wanted to look for and he wanted to look for it across all of the code bases. He knew we had SEMGREP and he knew how it worked and he knew that he had all the code in there and he wanted to search it all. And so Greg, just like what I appreciate about this guy is he's like a very creative thinker in how to use Snowflake to do things. So for whatever reason, Greg's like, let me try to do this in Snowflake. So he wired up what we have is called an external function, uh, which just calls a web service somewhere. And he put SimGrep on the other side of that external function. And then he sends that, you know, he does a search. He has, you know, in his ingestion, he's enriched it a bit. So he's got file metadata and everything else. So essentially he can target up files, pull them out of the database, send them to the external function along with the rules he wants to run and then get the result back. And then he can do that across all of the files at once, right? He can trigger all of these jobs in parallel because that's the way the database orchestrates the work. So he has this massive scale way to ask the entire code base a question about this. But, you know, he presents this and he's saying like, oh, it's slow because I got to make these web service calls. And, um, you know, uh, we want to be able to run SimGrep you know, natively ne next to the data. And by the way, we also have to do this translation of the get data to the file. And by the way, SimGrep has to, you know, generate the AST from the file. And so then we, I was so excited about this. I, I called you guys up and said, you got to see this. And I said, well, well anyway, we, we kind of had a conversation and said, well, what if we could pre-generate the, what if instead of ingesting the Git blobs or in addition to ingesting the Git blobs, we also ingested the AST continuously. And then we just brought the SimGrep engine to that AST that we had sitting in there. And a lot about Snowflake is one of these things we think is security teams who use security data lakes, it sounds a little bit egomaniacal, but it's like, we know how to use the data too, right? We already have a use case for that data, but what we're not so egomaniacal as to think that other people couldn't bring insights to it. So our model is all about like, I've already got the data. Now you bring your insights to my data and, that, and, and you give me your insights back. That way I can put it next to my data, right? And we can all you can see it's kind of this self-feeding thing where it's all my data and I can look at it and, and you can look at it and you have your expertise. And from your expertise, I can think of other new interesting questions I might wanna ask my data. So it's like a really beneficial arrangement, but for source code, for, for threat detection and, and things like that is very obvious, right? But for like source code and an AST, I guess only recently you can start to think like, oh, people just wanna ask their code questions. And here's, here's an on Snowflake approach that worked well well for us. And so anyway, we're you know, just exploring that further. And, and um, it's interesting to think about how other AppSec teams could, could benefit from, from, from an approach like that, right? What other value could they be deriving by treating their source code as data that they continuously query for things, right? And then who are the partners that could come and bring value to that source code, right? I think- um, Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, when you first told me about it, I was like, ah, that's so cool. Um, you're like, okay, we've got all of our source code. We're going to put that uh, in Snowflake or whatever sort of database system. Okay, cool. Right. Now we're just going to programmatically query it and like run arbitrary uh, sender rules or any static analysis check on those. Uh, and then like, oh, cool. What if we do some pre-processing to basically we're storing all the source code. Now we're storing all the abstract syntax trees. And then now we're just querying the source code for whatever property we run. Uh, and I could see a lot of uses for that. Um, which maybe we'll have a separate discussion sometime only uh, about this idea because I think it's so cool. But um, yeah, I, I think of it almost like a um, like you have cloud visibility and like attack surface visibility, but this right. is similarly like code visibility in terms of, you know, again, yeah. your developer productivity team who's like, we built this parsing library for you. Who's using it? Who's not using it? We think we're mostly in AWS, but I see someone spinning up Azure. Like this is interesting, uh, you know, like, oh, we have these Terraform uh, patterns that we want people yeah. to use, these building blocks we've applied. Hey, yeah. I see you're creating an S3 bucket that's not using the um, like template that we've created for you. Like, what's up with that? Um, yeah. so, it's and, almost like the, the AppSec data warehouse, Clint. I think AppSec people have struggled to find their place in the security data world. And I feel like I must look, we've, we've figured out a couple of interesting things. One is the threat model data and what to do with that in aggregate. If you structure it and store it, what can you do that's interesting? 
in, in aggregate with that. And then uh, again, here, here's another case of something kind of interesting you can do with, with that approach. So yeah, definitely. Uh, oh man, well, I have had an absolute blast uh, chatting with you, which is always the case. Uh, and there's, <laughs> Likewise. There's many there's many topics we're going to have to get into uh, another time in more detail. Um, but, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so, yeah, everyone watching, thanks so much for your time and attention. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Jacob again and a bunch of other people doing cool stuff. Um, so, I don't know, what do the kids say? So, you know, hit like and uh, smash that subscribe button yeah. uh, so you can uh, know the next time. Uh, but, yeah, any... Uh, just quick, like a uh, parting advice or parting words you want to make sure people take away from this? Oh boy. Uh, you know, no, I'll just go back to, to what I said, like the, the corniest advice, the, the biggest difference between, you know, is between success and not success is just deciding, deciding to do it. So I don't know. I, I, I think right now I, you know, I read a lot of tweets about people trying to break into security and being intimidated and all these things. I think look, the most important thing you got to believe in yourself first. And if that's not right, then it's going to be challenging. But beyond that, there's not much more to it. So I don't know. I think people should should really just be aware. Everyone feels imposter syndrome. And it's just a question of like, are, are you going to act or, or are you going to be a person who doesn't act? Uh, so and as, really the, big. <laughs> as the modern day uh, prophet Shia LaBeouf once said, just do it. Do it. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, cool. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Jacob, uh, and uh, talk soon, my friend.